Now, if you taking all this as this image of the good society, of course, the next step is to say the South represents the opposite to these Republicans. Um, the real and imaginary South. There's a real South and a, and a, and a South of the imagination uh, at the same time. Um, you can see a little of this in the um, excerpt on the reading list by uh, Frederick Law Olmsted in the Junap book. Now, who is Olmsted? Olmsted is a well-known uh, journalist and uh, urban planner. Actually, he's responsible for Central Park, Prospect Park, designed a lot of what we have in New York City, but he also in the 1850s was well known for his travels in the South. He published three volumes of a travelogue throughout the South. And Olmsted is very good in showing this image. The South is the opposite, the other of the North. Everything that is valued in the North, the opposite is the case in the South. It lacks the spirit of progress, he says. Interesting phrase in the excerpt in Janap, they buy little. They buy little. They don't have a big market. Purchasing things is a sign of civilization. You know, having a good credit card, going out there and using it all the time. Market participation is a sign of advanced civilization. They buy little. You might say, that's cool. They're not wasting all their money on junk. But no, um, they're not participating in the economic marketplace the way they should. They're aristocratic, whereas the North is democratic. They, are, they don't value education. They have a higher rate of illiteracy than the North does. Um, they ha they're in, in place of a middle class society with a lot of economic opportunity. Uh, they have a, a slave system and an oppressed class of poor whites with no opportunity for advancement. Now, again, this is an idiot. This is usually what happens when people go somewhere is they see what they expect to see. And Olmsted is seeing what he expects to see. It's not that there's no truth in it. There certainly is truth in what Olmsted was saying, but it's a sort of an exaggeration of the truth. For example, as I said, most white Southerners are not poor whites, they are yeoman farmers. They are small farmers. They are not particularly well off, but they're not poor in, this, in the way they are often described. Nonetheless, they are not as fully immersed in market participation as Northerners are. And generally, Olmsted sees an area of economic stagnation. William Seward, who I've mentioned many times, also was Seward in the 1830s when I uh, traveled around Virginia. And he wrote back to his parents, and uh, he says, it was necessary that I should travel in Virginia to have any idea of a slave state an exhausted soil, old and decaying towns, wretchedly neglected roads, and in every respect an absence of enterprise, absence of enterprise, you see, um, distinguish the region uh, from that in which we live. He wrote back that he wished a northern man from every county could visit the south, and this would clinch the victory of anti-slavery sentiment in the north. Now, of course, he's in an old declining, he's in Virginia, an old and somewhat declining area. He's not down in the Cotton Kingdom, which is the dynamic region of the South. But Seward is, um, he's a nationalist, he's an empire builder. Seward is, believes in an expansionary, powerful American republic, and slavery to Seward is a drag on that future. It's an obstacle to the future greatness. Why? Well, yeah, morally it is. It's a violation of our supposed principles and the Declaration of Independence. But fundamentally, he sees it just as an obstacle to progress. Um, that's why you have to oppose it. And this, just bracket this for future next week discussion. Um, you see how much, uh, how many of the issues I've been talking about so far have nothing to do with race. Nothing to do with race. Economic opportunity for Northerners, greatness of the nation. They're not, race, it, it's hard for us to separate these, but you can talk about slavery with race not being a factor. These, these bases of opposition to slavery uh, are sort of separate from whatever one's racial ideology might be. And the same refrain of Southern backwardness is echoed by um, a small cadre, uh, but very prominent in terms of Northern publicity, of anti-slavery people in the South. Hinton Helper, a North Carolinian who um, 
who wrote this book, The Impending Crisis of the South, in which he's, you know, he said the South is lagging behind the North in manufacturing and education and all sorts of things um, because of slavery. Again, Helper is a good example of what I just said. In, the, in a, um, I think it's the University of North Carolina has a copy of Helper's book that he himself owned. And in the margin, after the Civil War, he wrote, for proof that this book was not written on behalf of Negroes, as is sometimes charged, but on behalf of white people, see pages, blah, blah, blah. Helper's critique is that slavery is bad for Southern whites. It has nothing, he, he doesn't care particularly about the oppression of blacks. The institution degrades and makes impoverished uh, Southern whites. Um, so this is, as I say, a partial view, but not without some merit in that Southern society was, in, was very unequal. The fruits of this economic um, development going on in the South, first of all, you have four million people who are just completely outside any economic benefit whatsoever, i.e. the slaves. And then you have a large, as I say, free white, free white population, many of whom are not sharing the benefits. It's really, uh, to coin a modern phrase, you know, the 1% is gathering a lot of the um, economic benefit of uh, the cotton uh, kingdom. But my, whole, my point there is, is, you see, that the South seems very different for, uh, to, to Northerners. Um, and uh, what is their prescription? In order to improve, the South should become like the North, right? Should become like the North. You should have small farms in place of big plantations. You should have small towns. You should have uh, manufacturing, et cetera. And that idea of remaking the South in the Northern image will become a major impulse in the Reconstruction period. Reconstruction, rebuilding. Well, what are you going to rebuild in the South, or how are you going to rebuild it? Um, so, but, but my main point here is that it's in terms of this notion of a conflict of societies that this territorial question has to be understood. It's a question of which of these two social systems will eventually control the West. In other words, it's a debate about the future, not just about the handful of slaves who may or may not be in Kansas. Senator James Grimes, a Republican of Iowa, said in the Senate, talking about the Kansas-Nebraska bill, he said, the issue is, shall thriving villages and cities spring up all over the face of Nebraska, or shall unthrift and sparseness, stand still and decay, characterize that state? So this territorial issue struck home in the North in ways that the abstract moral question of slavery could not, because it affected the future, or people thought it affected the future of themselves or their sons, their daughters, um, would, would free labor or slave labor become the dominant form of economic organization uh, in the country? And it makes, my point again, it makes white Northerners feel that the question of slavery is of direct relevance to them and their prospects, not just the question of the slaves. So the Republican argument against slavery is moral, but it is also what the New York Times calls social and political economy. That's, that's the language that they are frequently speaking. And they link it with another key idea of this era, the slave power. The slave power. A shorthand for the way in which southern politi politicians do actually control the federal government. Certainly in the 1850s, the federal government, one after another, pursues policies attempting to uh, carry out the will of southern slave owners. The Supreme Court, as we'll see next time in the Dred Scott decision, completely validates the southern view of uh, the Constitution. The slave power controls the South, controls the nation, and again, this is a question not to do with race, but with political power and the feeling in the North that they are, even though they are growing dynamically, economically, they lack, they, they, they lack the political uh, influence, so to speak, uh, that, they, that they ought to have. So these this arguments are emotionalized, exaggerated, but there are real uh, 
social cleavages and political uh, stakes at the bottom of this uh, ideological discussion.